I've worked a lot of odd jobs in my life. PA, security guard, dishwasher. That's how it is when you're young and broke. It's also how one summer I got roped into a landscaping gig. I've never particularly enjoyed manual labor, but there's something satisfying about working with dirt. When I shoveled through the earth, I thought a lot about how each layer was from a different age, yet laid the foundation for the next one, building on top of each other to the present. Stories can be like that. Each time they're told, they take on another context until they become this many-layered thing. If you dig deep enough, you might uncover another and another till you find the bedrock that started it all. Today's story has more layers than most. That's why it's told in multiple parts. So if you haven't yet, go listen to part one. Otherwise, let me remind you how we broke ground. About 20 years ago, I was in South Carolina for my friend Alan's funeral. Alan and I hadn't spoken since a comic book collaboration ended our friendship. He tried to reach out, but I'd ignored his calls until I learned he passed away, which is how I ended up in Tefusky Island attending his burial and dealing with a whole lot of guilt. It's also how I met Alan's childhood friends, cousins Isadora and Pete Lewis, who convinced me to come to a tiny island where they began telling me a story about Alan they'd never told anyone before. This is our topsoil, an adventure tale where a young Alan, Dora, and Petey hunt for treasure on the island of Little Pale. And underneath that is a fairy tale about a mysterious witch who lurked there. Our young heroes traversed swamps and avoided the witch's traps, but something was watching them. Something twisted and terrible and profoundly strange and it chased them right to the witch's door. So now we dig deep into old dirt to reveal a ghost story. But this isn't just any ghost story. It's a horror born of that swamp. Something as foul as the gators and snakes and been there longer than the willows and old oaks. They call it the plat eye. You're listening to Run, Fool. I'm Rodney Barnes, and this is episode 39, The Plat Eye, part two. A crack of thunder boomed outside the old shack. A second later, heavy rain pelted the tin roof. Alan, Dora, and Petey looked at each other, bewildered by what the witch had just said. What the hell was a plat eye? But the old woman wasn't done talking. She bustled around the shack, closing shutters and placing pots beneath rain leaks, rumbling as she went. I don't appreciate folks bringing trouble to my doorstep. She crossed her arms, eyes narrowing. Those developers didn't send you, did they? The boys let Dora do the talking. No, ma'am, she assured her. I'm Dora, this is my cousin Petey, and that's Alan. We're not developers, just kids. From Defusky. The old woman cocked an eyebrow, sizing them up. In that case, I suppose you can stay till the storm rolls out. She took down a lantern and ignited a hearth, bathing the shack in orange light. The place was brimming with bottles and jars, bundles of dried herbs and the occasional animal bones strung from the ceiling. And lying in the corner was a big black hound dog. The kid's eyes grew wide. It did look like a witch's hut. The old woman sighed at them. Like I said, I ain't no witch. I don't mess with that bad magic. But if y'all don't trust me, you could always go back outside. All three kids shook their heads. Wise choice. You know our names, Alan remarked. But what's yours? The witch, who was not a witch, smiled. I'm Willa Dean Skinner, but you can call me Miss Willa. For an alleged swamp witch, Miss Willa was rather gracious. She fed the youngsters, and afterward, they settled around her old hearth. She sat in a rocking chair, petting the hound at her feet, who they learned was named Angus. The storm rattled the frail shack, making the kids jump. Don't be nervous, Miss Willa advised. 
Y'all safer here than anywhere on this island. You see my door? The kids nodded. Spears can't cross that color blue. Or bottle trees. I got those all around. Plat I can't get anywhere near here. Dora looked warily at the door. I- is it like a ghost? I hain't, the old woman corrected. They're troublesome spirits. Low country is full of them. But plat eyes are a special kind of hain't. The angriest. Miss Willa lit a tobacco pipe and exhaled a cloud of sweet-smelling smoke. Because a plat eye isn't just a spirit. It's the spirit of someone who had something unspeakable happen to him. Miss Willa told our young heroes everything she knew about plat eyes. But I'm going to give you some context most of you don't know. The origin of plat eyes comes from the Gullah, descendants of the enslaved people who toil for generations in the swamps and bayous of the Low Country. Gullah culture is steeped in folklore, and they got some really good ghost stories. But plat eyes are some of the strangest. They're often the souls of people who've been murdered. Their spirits become trapped between worlds, doomed to haunt the site of their death, so they get angry. But I'd be pissed too if I had to spend eternity in a swamp. The twisted thing about plat eyes is that the inhumanity of their murder turns them into something equally monstrous. A kind of spectral, shape-shifting boogeyman that can assume the form of any creature that suits them at the moment. Its ever-changing body as unsettled as its soul. But here's the catch. It's a lousy mimic. Whatever form they take, there's always something off about it. Maybe it's the wrong size or color or has too many legs but you can always tell by its enormous round glowing eyes. However, Miss Willis stressed that this doesn't make them any less dangerous. Plat eyes are clever. That's the worst part, and nasty. They watch you till they figure out what you're scared of, then prey on your fears. But they're also territorial, because the thing about a plat eye is it's always protecting something. She stopped herself then, but she'd already caught Alan's attention. He knew she was talking about the treasure. The old woman took another puff off her pipe, shaking her head. An ugly thing happened to that man to make his soul that way. An ugly, ugly thing. So you know what happened to him? Dora asked. Miss Willa nodded. Enough to know it ain't for young ears. We're all 13, Alan assured her. You can tell us. Miss Willa shook her head. You're not grown enough yet. But when you come back in a few years, Lord willing, I'm still around and I'll tell you everything. Because you should know what happened to him. People around here used to know the story. But you see, folks don't like to talk about bad things. So they just move on. But the fact is, whether we like it or not, the truth's still there. And when you ignore it, it begins to rot. She exhaled another cloud of tobacco. That plat eye's been festering in this swamp a long time. Some nights I hear him yelling from the pain of it all. Hard thing to listen to. A chill ran through Alan's body. Aren't you scared of him? He asked her. I am, she replied. Downright terrified. But I'm more afraid of the foul things folks do to each other than I am a ghost. By the time Miss Willow was done talking, it was late. She dug up a couple of quilts and the trio curled up by the fire with Angus. It was like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting. Except outside, a phantom shapeshifter was haunting the swamp. But our heroes slept like babies all the same. Sometime later, Alan woke up. He blinked, looking around the dark shack. The fire and the hearth had died. And beside him, Petey and Dora were fast asleep. But then, Alan's ears picked up a different sound the soft echoes of a distant voice. He sat up to listen when the shutters blew open with a clatter. Then the front door groaned, swinging open to the empty porch. Alan's heart pounded in his chest. He looked around, but everyone was still sleeping peacefully, and something told him not to wake them. He stared through the doorframe to the waiting swamp beyond. A man's voice was calling from somewhere, low and faint. Alan. Alan felt inexplicably drawn to it. Before he realized what he was doing, he walked into the night. 
It stopped raining. The bayou was cloaked in fog and unnaturally still. Alan. Alan followed the echoes through the fog. The further he walked, the denser the landscape became and the louder they grew. Alan. Until suddenly, they stopped. All right, fellas. Sometimes you want to be spontaneous, and you know what? Spontaneity just doesn't happen. So what do you do? Do you sit there looking sad and feeling bad about yourself? Or do you get yourself some hymns? Because if you get hymns, you've got help. You lift up your spirits and other things, too. The process is simple. 100% online. No insurance is needed. You pay one low price for your treatments, your online visits, ongoing shipments, and provider messaging. It's perfect, guys. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash run. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash run for your personalized ED treatment options. Hymns.com slash run. The products mentioned are chewable compounded products which are not approved or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. He looked around when he heard something different. The sound of approaching voices. Alan ducked into the undergrowth just as people emerged from the fog. It was as if they'd walked out of a void. First, two men, white men, an older and a younger, carrying lanterns and wearing old clothes. Then, a black man stepped from the fog, pushing a wheelbarrow with great effort. As Alan saw his face, he was struck with an impossible, inexplicable feeling. He knew this man. He knew that he was young, 20 years old, barely out of boyhood. He knew that he was a new father to a baby girl, just three weeks old, and he knew that he was enslaved. Alan also knew, though it was obvious by his face, that the man was terrified. Alan understood all of this, but he didn't know why. Alan held his breath as they walked past, Then, as soon as they turned the bend, he crept out to follow them. Watching the glow of their lanterns, Alan trailed them from a distance to the far side of the island, catching sight of them just as they disappeared through the mouth of a cave. Inside, the older overseer nodded to the younger, who handed the young black man a shovel. Alan hid behind a large rock and watched as he began to dig. The man dug and dug in the lantern light, and as he did, the overseers gave direction. Deeper, longer, deeper again. Once they were satisfied, the man climbed out and lifted something heavy out of the wheelbarrow. Alan's heart nearly stopped. It was a chest, and in the same way he knew the man, Alan knew that chest was full of gold. With muscle straining, the young man carefully lowered it into the pit. He began to cover the chest with more dirt when the younger overseer spoke. That ain't necessary. As the black man turned around, Alan watched fear creep across his face. I I, I don't understand, he muttered. But Alan knew he did, that he'd understood long before this moment. It's here, dear listeners, where we uncover the deepest layer of our tale, the bedrock of it all. Because at the heart of our ghost story is a very real tragedy, one born of human cruelty. But ain't that always the truth? The old overseer stepped forward. You can't let you leave it here, Sam. You know that. The man, whose name was Sam, slowly shook his head, eyes widening. I won't tell anyone where it is. I swear it. The younger overseer chuckled. You can't trust you're not lying. Sam looked the man in the eye. I don't lie. Never lied a day in my life. He put his hand on his chest. I swear on my daughter. Please. Alan watched, suspended between the disbelief of what he was witnessing and the horror that it might actually happen. 
turn around and kneel, the younger one ordered. But Sam kept standing, kept shaking his head. No, he told them. No, you can't. But the older man was removing his pistol. Sam's face cracked with grief. Tears streamed down his cheeks. You can't leave me here. The older man sighed. I'm sorry, Sam. I really am. Then he pulled the trigger. No, Alan screamed. He sprung up and charged at the man with the gun. But as if he was made of smoke, Alan ran right through him and tumbled into the open pit. He landed hard on fresh earth when he looked up. There, peering down at him, were two enormous eyes burning through the dark. The plat eyes stood at the edge of the grave, emotionless and perfectly still. Alan recognized the rags draped on its gaunt limbs, its chin, the shape of its mouth. When the plat eyes spoke, it said, His name was Samuel Clay. Then earth rained down heavy on Alan's body. He screamed, clawing at the sides of the grave, but his cries were choked with dirt as he was buried alive. <laughs> Alan woke up gasping for air and found Petey, Dora, and Miss Willa all staring at him. He was back in the shack, safe. Outside, it was still raining. He told them what he'd seen, the fog, the men who'd stepped out of nowhere, and finally, what he witnessed in the cave. They shot him. Alan's voice then dropped to a whisper as he realized they buried him while he was still dying. Tears stung his eyes. It felt real, like I was in the grave. Miss Willa stared at him, uneasy. Then she pulled the quilt off Alan's body. Underneath, he was covered in mud. Dora and Petey's eyes went wide with fear. Alan looked at his muddy body, then up at Miss Willa, terrified. Am, am I going to die? No, child, she said. I believe he came to you because you've been touched with death already. Alan's mind flashed to the choking smoke, the roaring flames, his father's face before Alan lost him forever. He had been touched with death. Miss Willa eased herself into her rocking chair. It's time that you know why they did what they did to that poor man. During the Civil War, Miss Willa began, when Union troops began to invade, plantation owners got scared. Many of them fled with their fortunes, but some buried it. They went to the woods at night, or the swamp, and they brought along one enslaved man to dig. Then, you already know, they killed those men in cold blood. The idea was to keep the location of their fortune a secret, but the bodies were also intended as a kind of twisted protection against thieves. They had no idea how right they were, Miss Willa continued. They bound his spirit with the strongest black magic there is, murdering an innocent, and created a plat eye. But by the time the war ended, the master and his overseers were all long dead. Miss Willa shook her head. All that suffering, killing, and lying to hide away a fortune no one ever claimed. Been over a hundred years and the plat eye's still out there. The kids went quiet. But what if we can help? Alan asked. Miss Willa smiled sadly. I'm not sure there's enough human left in them to save. The next morning when the rain cleared, they said their goodbyes on Miss Willa's porch. Petey knelt next to Angus, and the massive black hound licked his face. Y'all better be home for a duck. But if you're not, Miss Willa handed Dora a jar of amber liquid. You're gonna need this. Dora raised an eyebrow. Alcohol? Moonshine, Miss Willie explained, is the best weapon against a plat eye. If you pour it out, he'll stop to lick it up. Then you'll run like hell. Alan turned to her. I thought we had to be gone before dark. Miss Willie put a hand on his shoulder. That's right. But something tells me you're not going to be able to live the rest of your life keeping things buried. Now that he knew the location of the cave, Alan was more hell-bent than ever on completing the journey. If they followed the path from his dream, they could get to the treasure and maybe even free the plat eye. They just needed to get the hell off Little Pale before dark. 
but you know what they say about the best laid plans. Alan led Petey and Dora into the deepest part of the swamp where the canopy blocked out the midday sun. But after hours of walking, he couldn't find anything familiar. Alan stopped, searching the trees in vain. I think we're lost, Dora sighed. Petey nodded. Maybe we should go back. The idea was tempting. Just go back. Alan considered it, but he knew what was waiting for him there. A reminder of the very thing he was trying so hard to escape from. Meanwhile, the kids didn't notice the evening frogs begin to chirp, or that beyond the shelter of the canopy, twilight was fading to night. But Petey noticed something. Do you hear that? He asked. All three kids froze, listening. It was the sound of a dog, whimpering. And then they saw it half hidden in the trees. Angus, Dora gasped. Miss Willis' pure black hound was limping through the swamp, whining in pain. Come here, boy, Petey called. What's wrong? The dog walked closer, yards away, dragging his back leg behind him. A pearl-white bone jutted from his black fur. He's hurt, Petey cried. The kids started toward him, but as they stepped closer, Alan noticed a foul smell, like rotten meat. He stopped dead. Dora did too. It's a trap, Alan whispered. It's a trap. Alan screamed it so loud, Petey turned around. But ahead of him, the dog already emerged from the trees. The canine's stomach was split open. Glistening organs dropped from its belly into the mud, covered in pale maggots. Its broken neck jerked unnaturally as it opened its snout and emitted a low, unnatural gurgle. Petey turned to look straight into the searing, manic eyes of the plat eye and screamed. Petey ran when suddenly he dropped into the earth. He'd fallen into one of Miss Willa's animal traps. No, Alan realized. He'd been lured there. The plat eye stalked toward the pit, snarling. Alan's mind raced when he remembered the moonshine. He whipped out the jar Miss Willa had given them opened the lid and poured it on the ground. The plat eye sniffed the air and charged. Run, Alan screamed. Dora and Alan sprinted to the pit and used the shovel to drag Petey out of the trap. Then they flew through the swamp, back the way they came, when Alan turned around and ran the other direction. Now, as nuts as it sounds, he didn't have a plan. What drove him back into that dark swamp was what Miss Willa said about keeping things buried. He couldn't live like that anymore, and now he was going to do something about it. Alan's legs burned as he ran faster than he ever had before, back toward the danger. But once he arrived, he was alone. The plat eye was gone. Alan whipped around, his grip tightening around his shovel. He was suddenly aware of how vulnerable he was. The swamp was so much darker now. True night had fallen. His heart began to pound when he smelled something. An acrid burning stench that stung at your eyes. The kind of smell that settles deep into your skin and takes days to wash away. The kind of smell you never forget. Alan froze, his chest tightening. Heat radiated through the swamp. Not the hot damp of humidity, but an intense sweltering that hit him like a furnace. And then he saw light. Alan watched it smolder in the dark swamp like a star, casting everything around it in an orange-red glow. He shielded his eyes from the blinding light as it approached, until... Alan. Alan. The voice was raspy, almost inhuman, and yet Alan would know it anywhere. Hope coursed through his entire body. That was his father's voice. Alan opened his eyes, squinting. Dead? He whimpered. But as Alan's eyes adjusted to the light, they widened in horror. There, engulfed in a small inferno, was what was left of his father. Flames billowed around him, licking his body, melting his features into a disfigured suit of flesh. Alan stifled a scream as he watched the skin slough off his chest, exposing raw muscle underneath, his father's jaw unhinged in a tortured wail. Alan! Why did you do this to me? 
Helen's whole body was shaking. He didn't want to see this. He couldn't. But something in him willed him to stay. His father's lipless mouth quivered. It's your fault. It should have been you. It should have been you. Tears streamed down Alan's cheeks. The shame and guilt he'd pushed down the last year cascaded through him now. I, I, I'm sorry, he muttered. I, I, I'm so sorry. As Alan confronted this fresh hell, he remembered the last image he had of his dad alive. The fear on his face, but also the fierce love in his eyes as he saved his life. But when his father's flaming body stepped closer, Alan realized those were not his father's eyes. They were wild and tormented, as smoldering as the fire that engulfed them. Alan set his jaw. No, he muttered. You aren't him. I know who you are. The plate eye howled in agony, but Alan held his ground, shouting over his wails. Your name is Samuel Clay. Alan shielded his face as the inferno flared. Then, it extinguished. What stood in the embers churned and roiled. Its features shifted like a kaleidoscope across its body until finally it settled on a form Alan recognized. A tall, gaunt figure, dark skin, but pale. The plat eyes approximation of the man it once was, the one that came to Alan in his dream. His enormous eyes bored into Alan. I know what happened to you, Alan whispered. I want to help you. Please, just show. <laughs> The plat eye lunged, then dragged Alan screaming through the swamp. He clawed at roots, at vines, anything to save himself. But the plat eye's hands were locked around him like a vice. Alan squeezed his eyes shut, bracing himself for whatever hell they were headed toward. When they stopped, he opened his eyes. It was damp and dark, but just feet away, the plat eye's moonlight gaze cast the space in an eerie glow. A chill rushed through Alan. They were in the cave. By some strange miracle, Alan realized he was still holding the shovel. He gripped it tight as the specter lifted a crooked arm to point at the earthen floor and uttered one word. Dig. Listeners, when a shape-shifting phantom tells you to do something, you listen. So Alan got to his feet, heaved that shovel, and broke ground. He was terrified but something was rising in him that was stronger than fear, the determination of one person desperate to save another. Because though the man below his feet was long dead, Alan could feel him. He'd been trapped, waiting for someone to come for more than a hundred years, and Alan wasn't going to make him wait another second. He dug with a strength that he didn't know he had. With each plunge, he dug through years, decades, then generations of Earth. Across the grave, the plant I watched on, and though Alan didn't realize it, it was fading. There was a metallic thud as the shovel hit something solid. Alan dropped to his knees when his hands grazed smooth bone. He gently brushed away the dirt to see the round, hollowed eyes of a skull. The eyes of Samuel Clay. Alan looked up, but the plant eye had vanished almost entirely. All that was left of the Phantom were his two burning eyes. Then finally, even they extinguished. Outside, dawn broke, filling the cave with soft light. Alan's chest heaved, his tears mixing with the earth. He'd realized something. The Plat Eyes haunting was a plea, a plea to be seen, for someone to recognize the truth, no matter how terrifying. But now, its work was done. Samuel was finally free. And Alan realized he was too. Before they left Little Pale, Alan, Dora, and Petey gave Samuel Clay a proper burial. Miss Willow led the ceremony, of course. Nothing would be enough. But they acknowledged he'd been there, that he suffered, but also that he lived. When the trio returned to Dufusky, everything felt different. They'd only been gone three days, but it felt like a lifetime. None of them were the same after. Alan finally told Dora and Petey the truth about the fire and the immense guilt about his dad's death. 
It brought them closer together. But also, it made them realize growing up doesn't mean moving on from the hard stuff. It's about being strong enough to face it. So they shelved their California dreams and stayed in Tefusky. By this time, the cousins had finished their story, but I still had questions. Mainly, what did they do with all that treasure? Pete grinned, you're looking at it. Our fishing boat had arrived at their fabled island. It was actually pretty in a way, lush green and draped in willow trees. Isidore explained that in the end, they decided the treasure wasn't theirs to take. Instead, the right thing to do with something that caused so much pain was to turn it into something good. So they gave it to Miss Willa. And that year, before the developers pounced, she officially purchased Little Pale and rechristened it Sam Clay Isle. Now everyone in Low Country would know his name. The three made a pact to visit the island every year to pour out some moonshine for Samuel Clay and Miss Willa. And tonight, we were doing the same for Alan. It was twilight when we stepped onto the island. Isadora, Pete, and I picked our way through the bayou until we came upon a small cave. I ducked inside and laid eyes on the grave of Samuel Clay. It was a heavy moment, but what really got me was the headstone. It was covered in intricate drawings in vivid color. Alan's handiwork. I'd recognize it anywhere. He'd taken the tragedy of that place and made it something beautiful. Seeing that made it all come home for me. You see, we're all haunted by something, but burying things doesn't make our ghosts go away. Instead, they change shape, becoming more tormented until they're impossible to ignore. The only way to live with ghosts, with haints, is to acknowledge them and listen. And maybe, if we do it right, we can set them free. As Isidore and Pete made their way back to the boat, I hung back for a moment. I took in that dark bayou and talked through the night sky. I told Alan what I wished I'd told him while he was still alive, that I missed him too. I always had. Then, I thanked him for sending me here, for teaching me a lesson I didn't know I needed to learn. I'd like to say something supernatural happened then, something profound and mysterious. But the haints that were haunting that island, and the ones that had been haunting me, had faded away to some place better. Run Fool is a production of Ballin Studios, Campside Media, and Atwell Media. It is hosted and executive produced by me, Rodney Barnes. This episode was written by Alex Garland and produced by Abakar Adan and Lee Mengistu. Editing by Abakar Adan. It was sound designed and mixed by Greg Devins II. Sound director, designer, and mixer is Kevin Seaman. Creature vocalization by Terry Cashburn and artwork by Jessica Clogston Tyner. Production support by Jeremy Bone and Cole Lacasio. Special thanks to our operations team, Doug Slaywin, Ashley Warren, Sabina Mara, and Destiny Dingle. Executive producers at Ballin Studios are Mr. Ballin, Nick Witters, and Zach Levitt. Executive producers at Atwell Media are Will Malnati and Rosie Garrett. Executive producers at Campside Media are Matt Scher, Josh Dean, Vanessa Gregoriadis, and Adam Hall. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.